Welcome, my name is Maria. I'm a PhD student at CMU LTI, and I work on non-standard language and how individual linguistic innovation drives larger scale language change. Today, I'll be talking about the phenomenon of informal romanization, but first I wanted to position it with respect to this line of research and NLP in general. So rule-based and early statistical NLP systems were built for standardized language, usually within a single domain and genre. For example, this sentence here is from Penn Treebank. It's sourced from the Wall Street Journal, which is a formally written financial news source. But now we want to apply our systems to a variety of domains and genres. Like ideally, we would want uh, to have a single machine translation engine that, have, uh, that has the ability to translate sentences both from Twitter and from the Wall Street Journal. And many of those domains are likely to contain linguistic innovation, such as unconventional spellings on Twitter or made up words in fiction, or even in the newswire as well, like in the example of the New York Times here. So what I mean by linguistic innovation here is non-standard and novel linguistic items on different levels. On the lexical level, this would be new words like brony, on the morphological level, it would be new morphemes like the root gate in the meaning scandal or their novel combinations. And on the orthographic level, these would be non-standard spellings like uh, this spelling of the word tonight. And specifically, I'm interested in how these items can be understood early in their life cycle. So before they enter the dictionaries, before they become established in the vocabulary of the community of speakers, like the word tweet by now has. And people can often figure out the meaning of such non-standard items from their form and from context, but NLP systems still largely treat them as noise. Uh, so subword modeling can help with getting meaningful representations of these items, but only to a limited extent. This is not a solved problem in NLP. Um, so there are two main research questions here for me. The first one is, how do people infer meaning of such non-standard items? And to some extent, we rely on the shared knowledge, like uh, to understand the spelling of tonight that I showed in the previous slide, you'd need to know the pronunciation rules of English and that the digit two corresponds to the English word two. But also we use a compositional reasoning like uh, we know how to combine the pronunciation of these two segments to figure out that it has to sound something like tonight, or um, how to combine the meaning of individual morphemes to understand uh, the meaning of a complex morphological derivation. And the second question is, how can we get our NLP systems to that level of understanding? And uh, I'm just ignoring the entire sociolinguistic dimension here. I'm only talking about the literal meaning of those words. And there's historically two approaches here. The first one is text normalization, which means converting these non-standard items to some kind of a representation in standardized language. And the second is improving the systems themselves, making them more robust to variation, usually by pre-training on what people call noisy data. And the word noisy here could correspond both to actual noise, to truly random corruption of the data, and to non-random creative phenomena like what I'm discussing here. I think it would be really interesting if we could encode this human-like compositional creative reasoning into the models, but the approach I'm going to discuss in this talk is still closer to text normalization. Um, finally, I wanted to mention why this kind of uh, phenomenon happens. And specifically, I wanted to compare two examples that are similar in a lot of ways in that they both use a non-traditional script to represent uh, a text in a language. And uh, it could be used creatively, uh, like to express extra linguistic information, like in this example of for Cyrillic, where the author uses Cyrillic characters in English text to evoke associations with the Soviet Union, which is the same reason why they use the red color font and the imagery. But also it could arise out of necessity. For example, in the early 2000s, browsers would often have encoding problems like shown here. If you type something in Cyrillic, it would come out like this, completely unreadable. And uh, one easy way to circumvent this would be to encode your Cyrillic uh, script language, like Russian in this example, 
in uh, Latin characters. And this is exactly what I'm going to be talking about today. So uh, what is informal romanization exactly? Romanization means rendering non-Latin script languages in Latin alphabet. And I call it informal because it's not standardized. We're not talking about uh, official romanization systems like Pinyin. And it's used predominantly in informal online communication. The need for informal romanization arises out of Unicode issues, like rendering problems I've shown in the previous slide, or extra cost of transmitting messages containing Unicode symbols. Or it might also be due to keyboard availability, like for immigrants living abroad, or when typing in the native character set is too complicated. Uh, so in this table here, I'm showing a few different romanizations for one Russian word, one Arabic word, and one Greek word. As I said, the process is not standardized. The character substitution choices are up to the user, which is why each of the words in this table has multiple romanizations. And another interesting dimension, which I'm only going to touch on here, is that um, these substitution choices can also convey social meaning. So they can tell us um, about the person's native language or dialect or what language is spoken where they live or even demographic variables like age. But we're not focusing on this in this talk. And most of the character substitutions are based on either phonetic similarity or visual similarity between characters. And here in the table, uh, I highlighted some variation uh, between substitutions where I colored the phonetic substitutions in blue and uh, visual substitutions in red. Of course, these two types don't cover the entire spectrum of possible substitutions. Some can be based on conventions and or on um, a correspondence between keyboard layouts in different languages, but that's relatively rare compared to the similarity-based one. But what does it really mean for two characters to be phonetically similar? We can say that Cyrillic G is similar to Latin G, but they both actually have a whole variety of different phonetic realizations. Like G in English can be pronounced G or J or J or be silent. And that's not even counting any other Latin script language. That's just English. So uh, there's two main ways that I've observed in the data of um, associating characters through phonetics. And the first one is associating through the most prototypical phoneme for a character. Like for a G in Russian, it would be G, and then G would be the most appropriate substitution. I'm not sure how speakers come up with this prototypical sound. Maybe it's just the most frequent uh, phonetic realization in the language. But I wanted to point out that we also use this kind of out of context association in language learning. Uh, this example is courtesy of Matt Gormley, who told me about this educational toy that for every character sings you a song uh, giving the most prototypical sound for this character. Like here it tells you A says A. And after the end of the song, it would actually list the other possible pronunciations. So maybe it's helpful for children to learn the more prototypical sound first and then sort of extend it to the whole spectrum. The other type of phonetic substitution is based on the phonetic realization in context, like we would do in, say, transliterating named entities. Uh, here we have two Arabic words where the same character Aleph is pronounced E or A, and it's romanized as E or A, respectively. The other kind of similarity is visual. It's based on glyph shapes. Uh, like two characters in different alphabets uh, being expressed with the same exact glyph, like Cyrillic A and Latin A, or just similar looking glyphs like Cyrillic G and Latin R. A single non-Latin character can be expressed by two or even three consecutive Latin characters. And to make this even more complex, the visual similarity can be conditioned on a transformation. Like here we have Arabic ayin that looks kind of like a mirror digit three, so it's often substituted by uh, a three. And um, this kind of similarity can be conditioned on just a part of the glyph. Like here we have an olive with Hamza being represented as two, because Hamza, the top part of the glyph, kind of looks like an inverted two. And of course, this is not just some arbitrary part of the glyph. Uh, Hamza is one of the two distinctive halves of this letter. 
but I'm just bringing this up to highlight what challenges we could face if we were to automate this kind of similarity. There are also structural constraints in the process of romanization. For example, the alignment between the input and output characters would be monotonic because you want to preserve the character order. But the nature of alignment also depends on the type of writing system that the language uses. I'm going to briefly introduce them here, but if you'd like to learn more, Richard Sproul's keynote here at SIGTYPE is a great resource for that. Um, languages like Russian that are written using alphabets uh, map to their romanized versions roughly one by one. Oh, sorry, one to one. And of course, not entirely one to one, as you can see in this example where the letter SHA maps to the digraph SH. But still, mostly we can assume it's one to one. App chats, where characters mostly represent consonants, would also have a mostly one to one alignment. But there will be a lot of null alignments for vowels that are not represented in the native script. Arabic would be an example of such a language. And um, abugidas or alpha syllabaries, the kind of writing system that's uh, used for many South Asian languages, uh, has each character expressing an entire syllable. It's actually a bit more complex than that. Some characters here are compositional, some are not, but I'll come back to it later. For now, let's just say it's a one to many alignment. And uh, the task I'm going to focus on in this talk is deciphering informal romanization. So we will be converting the romanized text into the conve conventional orthography of the language. So in a way, we are standardizing these innovative non-standard spellings. And we experimented with three languages here, Russian, Arabic, and Canada, all written in different scripts. So this was an introduction and a brief problem statement. And I'm going to define the task more formally in the next section.